trying to keep elected members happy with um, fiddling about repairing machines when in actual fact he's not maintaining databases as he ought to be. Yeah. Well, what can we do? I hope you can both see the screen all right. Yes, thank you. And I hope that you both feel that you're here for the right course. So what we're going to cover today is um, really the basics of Parish Online. Uh, I move on to, uh, well, if I come back to my screen, maybe with you a second. There. Uh, we are recording today's event, and the reason that I do that is because we tend to go through these slides very quickly uh, and to send you the recording and the uh, presentation afterwards enables it. If there are any points that you want to sort of check up on or follow up on, you can do that in your own time without any issue. So we do send that off to you shortly after the event is finished. Uh, do please feel free to butt in at any time should you wish um and let's see what we're going to do so we'll briefly mention the licenses you need to bring the system up to the highest degree of definition i suspect you probably both got those in place but anyway that's what we'll do. then we'll talk about what parish online how it works and what it can do which some of that will be a small repeat of yesterday phil but I'm yeah that's worried. okay We'll talk about the principles of the base maps and the layers and how you're using those to increase people's understanding of what you're demonstrating to them. Uh, and then the fun bit comes when we're going to give you the, each the chance to create a layer, uh, which is basically the infrastructure, and then um, add a feature to it, which is um, sort of the first dot on the map, if you will. Um, and then we'll show you um, how to add and edit those records, um, add attachments to them, um, then it's to introduce you very briefly to the idea of menus, the asset register, and we'll go home after a Q&A session. So the map that you're based on is the Ordnance Survey's high definition map of the UK. And because you're working for government, you get free access to the license that brings that up to the highest degree of definition. So you move with a PSGA license from this sort of picture on the right hand side to that sort of detail. Um, and by the same token, with the aerial photography uh, and the correct license, you can go from there to there, which you may see the big difference is all the shadows and the detail that you get there from. So can I, can I pause you a minute, Graham? All I'm yeah. seeing is the three of us and a picture of you. What was that you were missing on Mexico part this evening? I, I, I can see the three of us, and I can see a lovely picture of you as the speaker, but I'm not seeing the shared screen. Ooh. Phil, you are seeing the shared screen? Yes, I've got the shared screen. All right, let's see. Um, I think the simplest thing to do, Stephen, may be to... Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. No, you... but, well, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So mm. what you should be seeing is a screen that's, that's heading is called Map Data License, and it shows yep, got it. you got Thank it. You. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Okay. So uh, anyway, I suspect that you both got um, the two licenses that you need. Yes. Um, but if you don't, then the, we will go through covering how to get it, which is Basically, if you don't need it, you if you haven't got them, you would go up to this top right corner uh, where there is a cogwheel. You click on that. It shows you a little drop down menu. You'd select help and support, which brings you up with this screen. And then you type in uh, get your PSGA number or PSGA, anything like that. And it comes up with this and that tells you exactly how to do it. And I mention this now because this is the principle that the whole of the, the help system within uh, Parish Online works. They call it the knowledge base, and you'll see that there's a, a tab up here called knowledge, knowledge base, but the search button here works throughout the system, so it works just as well whether you click on the search button on the home screen or whether you click on it on the, on the knowledge base screen. It works fine. Anyway, what does Parish Online do? What does it represent? How does it work? So it's basically just something that you access 
in the cloud via your browser. So you don't need to install any software. You don't need to worry about servers, databases, disk space, anything like that. Everything is done for you up in the cloud where it is rather securely looked after. So the data that you put up there is safe. Um, there's lots of help available when you create the information. Um, there's the knowledge base that we mentioned that uh, we'll go through, we'll touch on quite frequently. There is a user group, which is in its own way, completely brilliant because I started it. Um, the training that you get is unlikely to be surpassed because I give it. Um, and there's no sense of humor whatsoever in these things. <laughs> Moving on, um, the Parish Online people are remarkably good at support. If you email them in or when you're in the knowledge base and you don't find what you're looking for, you can open up a ticket. Uh, and they get answered very quickly. Most tickets I've I've created have been answered within less than an hour, and that compares with several days on other organizations. So that's very, very positive. Uh, however, why do you want to use maps? Well, I touched on this yesterday with Phil. Uh, there's a principle that I call location-based data in that everyone understands how to use their eyes. Uh, when they see something, if they want to know more about it, it's quite intuitive to click on that building. And with Parish Online, um, any data associated with any object in the maps is uh, brought up in a data record when you click on it. So clicking on something will give you more information about it if there's any to be had. Uh, lots of people tend to buy neighborhood, sorry, Parish Online in the first instance for neighborhood plans, and then they make the rather joyous discovery later that it can do all of these other functions as well. Um, and what I'm on a sort of a, a drive to do is to try to get um, all parish clerks to recognize that a lot of what they do will be more effectively uh, produced if they do it within Parish Online. So um, I'm sort of I'm an advocate for the product, and I think that um, you can speed up people's workload or reduce their workload quite a lot by getting them to use the software. So I sort of call this moving people out of the filing cabinet onto the cloud and trying to get data off pieces pieces of paper into a digital system where anybody can look it up uh, if they have an account and they can do it any time of the day or night. So um, you, you're moving from just one piece of paper locked away in a filing cabinet somewhere that is a, a mile away down a muddy track road in the middle of the pouring rain in the dark of night, or you can just click on your screen and bring it up, uh, whether you're one person or 20. So much easier to use the uh, digital mapping system, in my opinion. You can do your own maps, and we'll certainly show you how, to, in fact, we'll be doing that today. You'll be creating your own um, items. So you can cover every piece of ground that you can conceive of if it hasn't already been covered. And uh, there are all sorts of ways of getting information out to the community. So you can print maps on pieces of paper, you can send them out as PDF files, you can publish them to your local website. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, you can generate data in spreadsheets. So it's a very versatile system. Data comes from all over the place. Um, a lot of it is uh, from government. So you've got sort of DEFRA and Public Health England and uh, the Ordnance Survey themselves, the land registry, all pouring information into Parish Online. Uh, it's all there built in for you. You don't need to do anything. In areas where you've got enlightened local authorities, um, they're putting some of their data into place. Um, Lincolnshire we're working on. Um, uh, you're Cambridgeshire, aren't you, Stephen? I'm not quite sure yeah. how good Cambridge is at sharing their data, but uh, as I said, we're working on it on all of them. But lots and lots, literally hundreds of layers of information available to you, uh, and we'll explain you know, what, what all these layers are and how you bring them into play. Um, uh, Graham, um, I saw ICCM there. Yep. And we are members of ICCM. Right. Um. And there are obviously lots of other organisations. How would I know whether any of those organisations have actually uh, made data available for us? Uh, well, you can certainly ask uh, Geosphere themselves. There, um, and if they have a separate 
collection of layers under their name, which many of them do, then you would know that. In the case of ICCM, um, you don't know because they contribute to the cemetery maps. And uh, I have no idea of knowing which is the information they've put in and which has gone up from individual uh, councils and parishes. Uh, so I'm afraid I, I'm not sure I can answer your question accurately, um, but ICCM certainly does uh, um, pour any data that they've got into Parish Online. It actually works the other way too. They take the individual work that we do. Um, so ICCM is certainly knows where the cemeteries are. What they yeah. don't know is where each plot in each cemetery is. And okay. as as you add those plots, that can be passed up to them so that they have the information as well. Uh, okay. But as to, as to whether they've got your particular cemetery in place, that I am afraid I, I wouldn't know. Okay, thank you. Right. So there are plenty of examples of other councils that are using the system. Um, we'll show you how you get hold of their case studies in a minute. But these are just really testimonies to what each one is doing. So Faversham is using theirs for neighborhood plans, which is the sort of the traditional entry into Parish Online. Um, here's an example of the sorts of things you can do. So this is a piece of town somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and the first thing you want to say is this is a no go area, right? We're going to leave a local green gap between us and the rest of the world. And that means that applications to build houses and so forth, if they fall within that area, they're not going to be given. Uh, we also need local green spaces. And so we're going to work on a plan which creates green spaces in those areas. However, we do need to appreciate the need for trade. So we're going to put some trading um, industrial parks in. And finally, we're very so wary of people's views of the skyline and so forth. And so we'll put in the views that we need to take into account uh, when considering building. So all these are the pieces of information that you can put on a chart and enhance people's understanding of, of what they're talking about, what they're considering. And presumably you could put a photograph of those views and attach them to each of the sectors. Very good. Exactly right. You couldn't can indeed. So I love this example because it's so crystal clear. Celsi, um, obviously a seaside town, they've got this entire line of uh, footpath, of benches, of groins, all sorts of things to which they're responsible. They have to keep them clean. They have to keep them in fit state. They have to repaint them and all sorts of things. How do they keep track of it all? Every single one is located here as a dot on the map. And as we were showing earlier, if you want to find out when it was last inspected, when it was last painted, what did it look like when it was inspected, uh, you can see all that by clicking on the item. So we're back to location-based data, but they, they really go to town on it in Celsi. Uh, this is a really good example of saying, how do you want to clean up our, our, um, our village? We've got too many signs saying all the wrong things and certainly everyone wants to saw off the speed camera, but in case you've forgotten what a speed camera looks like, there's a picture of it. Uh, <clears throat> this one I think is is really useful to a lot of people. You know, where are the salt bins? How often is the council going to uh, fill them up? And do in fact know that the council know where our salt bins are because they may well differ from where they think our salt bins are. So a map is really helpful to make sure everyone's got the same view of the same asset. Cemetery management, as you happen to say, um, we have got uh, people pitching in and helping out. Uh, the plots, the sorry, the boundaries around cemeteries tend to already be known and they're in parish online. What may well not be known or so, certainly is not known is which plot applies to which family or which person or whatever. And you can add that information. It's thin, that, that one information will stay within your parish. It doesn't get exported. But um, the basic outline is provided for you, provided ICCM knows about it, which they don't always do. They're, they're not always up to date, these people. Uh, 
when you're getting planning applications in, most people sort of uh, on a council may well be aware of what the implications are of a particular location that somebody is trying to upgrade or change. But it's always a good idea to bring in the extra layers for people to think about. So is this within a site of special scientific interest? Is it in a conservation area? Is it going to be a flood uh, likely um, danger? So all those things you can throw in and you can best basically give people more information on which to base a decision. Uh, here's an example of uh, publishing to a website that we mentioned earlier. So Cox Green is uh, producing all of their planning applications as dots on the map. Click on any dot and it comes up with the details here. And we'll certainly get to doing that later in the course. Uh, Nether Stoey is taking um, exports from their maps and putting them here and here in their um, leaflet for tourism. Uh, and so uh, basically Parish Online is uh, sort of improving the product that they're able to come up with. Uh, case studies are important and they're on the website from Parish Online themselves. So I, I think this is really, really important um, it's a bit of a giveaway. If you look at Parish Online's website, they have a tab up about here called <coughs> Case Studies, which is really handy. And when you click on it, it brings up these. You can either show all of them or you can come down to any particular area that you yourself are interested in. The beauty of these is that somebody somewhere has probably done what it is that you're planning to do already. And the case studies not only show you what they've done, but what's really useful is they give you a step-by-step -step guide of how to get there. So um, I think that you, I find that these are really fascinating. I think they're very helpful. They're very colorful. They're very um, indicative of the innovations that people use to make the most of Parish Online in their area. So um, the one on the Long Sutton Village Shop is, is utterly fascinating because I wrote it but a uh, lot of the others you can go with as well. So I jumped ahead. So that's basically what the system can do. This is going to be telling you now how it does it. So the, you may be familiar back in the good old days of overhead projectors. If you wanted to share information with people, you put it on a transparent slide and you put the slide up for people to see. And then you started drawing on it with your felt tip pen or you started putting another layer of transparency over it to enhance the data. And Parish Online is a geographical information system that does exactly the same thing, but digitally. So it's going to uh, help you make uh, better decisions, be given the evidence, and the evidence is, is put up there in layers, just like the layers of the overhead uh, projector that we have here. That's all you're doing with your digital map. So you've got the underlying digital map from the ordnance survey and you can plonk on top whatever you will. Here's the overhead photography from the uh, photographs of Great Britain. Here you've got the listed buildings in that particular area. Here you've got DEFRA's uh, indication to you of what use is being made of the, uh, the land. And then you can see who actually owns each section with the land registry layer. You can bring in as many layers as you like um, the usual issue is having too many because then you clutter up the views so that no one understands it, but you can turn them on and off at will. So it's a matter just of jumping from one to another, just to make points as you wish, as you're using the system. So yes, layers help you, um, you can switch them on and off. Um, and the information is stored on the layer, as we mentioned it so that you can be looking at the map and there's nothing there, you turn on a particular layer and bingo, up come lots of sources of data. And as we mentioned- Question, you, Graham, if yep, I may. Yep, yep. Um, the land registry data, um, how current is that? What's the lag between property transactions and updating the data in the system? I'm- <clears throat> Roughly, roughly. Well, I, I'm sort of slightly hesitant over that because it, it gets confused over which department of government you're talking about. So one of the more recent um, additions to the system is the energy performance certificates, which come yep. through with every sale of a house nowadays. Yep. I'm horrified to say the update cycle on that is yearly. 
which is stupid because you've got councils trying to make policy decisions on how we're going to insulate part of our town and where are the areas without um, good you know, high level certificates and their information's a year out of date, it's pathetic. On the case of the land registry, I don't think it's anything like as bad as that. The ordnance survey themselves run on a 60 day cycle. So you may send information in and if it happens to arrive just before the end of the cycle, it'll be visible the next day. But if it happens to arrive at the beginning of the cycle, it may be a couple of months before you see it. And I suspect that the land registry is somewhere in between the two, but I, I don't know the actual date, I'm afraid. Um, they are, the land registry is, is um, assigned by government the duty of getting a hold of the ownership of every piece of land in the country. At the moment, and, and they're supposed to be doing that by the middle of the, nine, the 2030s, but their goal at the moment is to have every piece of publicly owned land described uh, by 2025. And I don't know if you've been caught yet, if your council has been asked to sort of say, do you have any areas of concern? The, the answer is, as you're probably well aware, there are gaps in their system. And some of the lines that they've got don't actually tie up with um, the, the actual physical uh, uh, land on the ground. Um, we, we did have a case on Friday, funnily enough, of someone who said uh, he, he couldn't tie in the registry land borders with his actual land. He said he then discovered they changed because the land registry has started using satellite photographs to depict where barriers are or, or lined boundaries between properties. And this particular fellow discovered that the satellite had been misinterpreted and uh, his garden shed had been interpreted as somebody else's house. And so a property boundary had been put around it, which didn't belong there. And he said that the inspector finally came out with his gadgets in his hand. He walked around, he completely agreed with the landowner and the whole system was updated the next morning. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure how frequently that is the case, but certainly if you get an inspector out because you've got an issue, then th their data seems to get updated very quickly. I'm not sure if this is any help to you. I'm sorry. I'm I just ask a question, <laughs> just a quick <laughs> one, Graham. Yes, I'm sorry. And we have a <laughs> local landowner who yeah. we believe has taken some parish council land by erecting a fence. And he claims that the land registry document is inaccurate and he doesn't accept that the land registry border, uh, boundary is the true boundary. I thought land registry boundaries were more or less sacrosanct. You couldn't interfere with them. Uh, well, <laughs> that is true until you start going back and, and you discover that they're, they're taking their title deeds from uh, documents that, you know, back in the, in the older days, they may not have been as accurate as they are now. OK. So uh, to some extent, I think there's right on both sides. Yes, he is correct in saying that the, uh, the land registry uh, boundaries are not always 100% sacrosanct, that's for sure. And But their attitude themselves in the land registry is saying, OK, we'll come out and take a look. Um, right. So I think they're quite cooperative. As you probably also discovered, that they're not cheap. Um, every time you ask a question from their website, it'll cost you three pounds, which I mm -hmm. think is disgraceful. But never mind. Um, I wrote and told them, I said, having because you're supported by the government, we've already paid for the information. So why are you charging us to give it to you? And they came back and yeah. said, as a matter of fact, we aren't supported by the government. So oh. It was a misunderstanding on my part. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, there are three types of layers that you can create or that exist or there already. And each one has a geometrical type. So there's points, which are things like bus shelters or lamp lampposts. You are lines, which are things like boundaries around fields or footpaths. And you've got everything else, which is a polygon. And you can have any one of those per layer, but you can't have more than one. So each layer must have one type, but it can only have one type. So if you're putting on information that requires both lines and points, then guess what? You need two layers and you just show them both at the same time. Yeah. And we'll be doing that. So some hints before we get going. If you can, please do use a mouse. It's much quicker and more accurate. Uh, stay, stay with the major um, 
browser manufacturers. Uh, an Internet Explorer is now so far out of date that it's really dangerous. Um, and try and use the entire screen if you can uh, for your browser, because again, it makes life so much easier when you're working in a digital map situation. Do, do you have a view on Microsoft Edge? <laughs> I, I kind of no. guess what it might be, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid I will do anything I can to stay away from Microsoft. So uh, it's not, I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, okay. I can't give you an answer because I never use it. Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, I use Opera only because I find that it's it's really really helpful um, in some of the the way it lay, lays out information. You can pulling up bookmarks and doing automatic synchronization of bookmarks and so forth. I find it extremely simple in Opera. It also uh, runs on any platform, and since I use Linux and Macs as well as Windows, um, then I, I want something that goes across all of them flawlessly and i find that's that opera is better than most but that's neither here nor there in terms of your using edge I, I don't know anything about edge i've never used it sorry um all right now we're just going to explain what it is that you see when you open up so some of this fill will be repeat excuse me please that's but okay steve for you um have you actually used parish online Are you looked at it um i had a crash around on it using a group <laughs> okay of, so uh, I'll give you the, the, the very quick basic verb. Uh, what you see when you start up is always your parish based somewhere in the middle of the screen because the system knows who you are and what you log in as. And so it says you're in the middle of the screen, but you're not limited to that. You can travel anywhere in the country. Um, it's, it follows the usual mapping rules. If you ever use Google Maps, you'll be a natural for this. So you have a plus and a minus a zoom out and in. And you have a scroll so you can zoom around. Oops, sorry, I should have gone that way. Um, to zoom up, down, left and right. You can go in on scale down to the, the slightest uh, couple of centimeters and you can zoom out to see the whole country. And I will be showing you that. So that's the map on the right hand side. This is the ordnance survey. Uh, the base map uh, always comes up. It's again, their highest definition product. The detail is fabulous. And we'll see more of that in a second. On the left hand side of the screen is a column which changes depending on what we're doing. So at the moment, it's showing you the various collections of layers. Each of these is a top level. If you click on, a, on the mini arrow to the right, you'll drop down and get however many layers there are underneath. So these are collections of layers rather than the layers themselves. Uh, but this can be other things as we move through the system. Um, at the moment, we don't have any layers turned on except the one that's got the ring around it, which is basically um, the, the standard PSGA map. And that's that. The next slides are just going to be four quick slides to show you how you can, get, in fact, roam all over the country. So if you zoom out as far as you can go, you get the entire United Kingdom, plus a few of those other places wrapped around us. Um, and you get very little detail. So all you see is the capital cities and that's it. However, if you come down into sort of county level, then you start seeing the scale here on the right. This distance covered here is, is represents 10 kilometers. So we're getting most of Somerset uh, in here, not all of it, but you're beginning to see certainly the town names, the road names and the village names. Uh, that's about it. Uh, but then we can go down. That's what I call the sort of county level. If you go down one more, you're now getting down to the parish level and you're beginning to see more details. So you're getting the names of individual pieces of land. You're getting not only the road numbers, but you're getting the road names as well. Uh, and you can certainly see far more uh, about the houses, the number of houses in any one place. Come on down into what I call village level. And now you can see much more detail of individual houses. You're certainly getting more details of addresses and so forth. And you, you can sort of see the shapes of complete farms. If Is I go North down, Hall was at the top of those maps? Uh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so if we now zoom in on what I call sort of the building level, you've got a scale here, which is indicating it's only 20 meters from there to there. So the whole thing is only looking at about uh, maybe 60 or 100 meters. Um, and you can see the level of detail, but you can go even further. 
I'm not Can seeing you... the scale you're referring to. Oh, okay. So down here at the bottom left, got a black. I no, can't see that. Really? Uh, I think you need to bring your screen down a little bit, Graham. That's, I have no idea how to do that. Um, on the right hand edge, you can draw down. I don't think so because I'm on a presentation. So it's not going to okay. respond to me. That's interesting. I'm sorry about that. Well, if you look at Parish Online at the moment, if you have it there on another screen or another tab, the, the scale is always down the bottom left corner. Okay. And it's it, all it does is just show you how much uh, land is covered in that particular length of line. The length of line varies depending on which scale you're in, and the scale obviously changes. So you can zoom in to virtually millimetric level. You know, you, this distance now, you can count the individual millimeters along there. That's about 150 millimeter long um, piece of brick. So coming back to talking about layers, at the moment, no layers at all switched on except the one that's circulized. Um, and we'll show you that. So this is just raw ordnance survey data uh, from their mapping system. Then the collections are set up so that the green ones tend to be about your base maps and the beige are collections, mostly third party that come in to help you out. There are literally hundreds of these layers. So they're broken down into collections to try and make you uh, help you get them sorted out. Uh, and there are ways of, of speeding up your selection, which we'll get into in a minute. So we're going to just say, just look at one of these uh, collections and see what lies underneath. I'm going to click on this one here. And you can see it opens up into three layers. And the one with the tick mark is the one that we're actually seeing. So we're looking at the standard map. Um, <clears throat> you can say, let's not see the standard map. Let's see the grayscale instead, just by clicking on them. And I've done that. You've now seen the map has changed to much more black and white type issue. Uh, and uh, it's useful if you're trying to print out and show something specifically highlighted. Um, I don't know many people who use this. If you've got a dot matrix printer, um, then presumably you're also lighting it by candlelight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're sort of back in the dark ages. But um, you turn layers on or off by clicking on them. The uh, slang, not uh, the, the vernacular for that is toggling. So we toggle on, we toggle off just by clicking on or clicking off. Uh, why use one syllable when you can use two? Um, so now I've turned on two layers at once, which gets a little bit confusing because one of them is the, is the overhead photography. And you can sort of see something of the photography here, but we've also got the map layer still showing. So you've got some of the names showing through and between yeah. the two, it's not immediately clear which is which. So to clarify that, we can say, Let's right click on the anywhere on this um, ordnance survey stack, the, the one that's in use, and we'll come up with a transparency slider. And if you say let's slide it all the way to zero to the left, so that there is no map shown here, all you see is the photography. And now it's much more clear, isn't it? But there's no mapping information, no names, nothing at all, because we don't write on our fields very much in this country yet. Uh, you can go the other way and say, let's turn the transparency of the map fully up, and that turns off the, the uh, photography so you can't see any of that. But what they're trying to say is, look, somewhere between the two will be a nice balance for you of a little bit of map information plus a lot of photography information, because you look at this, you've got no idea where it is. Uh, unless you happen to know, obviously. But as soon as you turn on the little bit of map information, you can see there'll be a big sign coming up saying long Sutton, and you think, well, that makes it easier. So this is just how you can merge layers to get the level information that you want across. Right, I, I put this slide in here because occasionally this happens, that the system sort of gets itself a little bit confused after it's been working with the photography, and you can end up with a white screen and the solution is very simple. Just click on the refresh icon up the top left here. Uh, and the whole system basically sorts itself out and comes back and starts again. Right, so now I'm gonna show you how you can use these layers and then bring in information uh, from these mostly third party ones down here. So 
I'm assuming that you have no idea what's in all this lot, but you might be interested in saying flood information. Uh, I showed you on that on one of the slides earlier. And as it happens, Long Sutton in Somerset is in the middle of what's known as the Somerset levels, which are at or below sea level. And so remarkably um, responsive to water when it arrives from the clouds. So to find out what it looks like when it rains here, we're going to type in this search icon up here the word flood. And on the next screen, you'll see that's just what I've done. I've typed in flood, and the system has automatically narrowed the number of layers down to three collections. And each of these collections will have layers in that talk about flooding. So I'm just going to say, let's talk about the, uh, the Environment Agency's floods. We click on there, and therefore you can see there's something like 10 levels of layers of information. So I say, what happens when we do the zone three check? And lo and behold, most of Somerset disappears underwater. Um, and you can see how useful this is going to be for planning applications. The poor old person that's moved into the area might have no idea that just here is where he'd like to put his house. Unfortunately, he's going to spend three months of the year underwater. So we turn off that layer by clicking on the X. Um, and I've now sort of shown you, if you will, how you select maps from the, uh, the green selection, the aerial photographers from the green selection, and the layers from the, the beige. So how do we use that? Well, I'm showing you an example. Uh, I, we've created a layer which shows us where the trees that were given to us by the tree charter people have been planted. Now they say, look, we'd like to give you 50 trees and the only condition we place upon you is that you keep track of what, what happens to them. So we said, fine, we'll put them into parish online. And this farmer donated a sort of a field so we're going to click on the red area. Remember, to get location-based data, you just click on any item. And up pops the associated data record with this uh, particular record. And amongst other things, it tells you who owns them, uh, where are they, and when did the trees get planted. Uh, but the really thing that's of interest here is the attachments. So to find out what those attachments are, we click on the plus sign. And we see that these are a bunch of photographs. And you can check on any one of those photographs just by clicking on the, the down arrow. And here is a picture that shows the young saplings going in. So each one has got its own little protective uh, tube. The tube is held in place by uh, a splint, if you will, just to hold it uh, upright. Uh, we've got lots of water here to prove to you that we do indeed flood in Somerset. Um, and this was a picture that was taken when the trees first arrived. Now that was three years or two years ago. So every year after that, you take another photograph to show how they're doing, which ones have died, which ones have thrived. Um, and then as the time comes to uh, move them to uh, areas where they can permanently grow, uh, you follow them and track them and, and put each one in the line so that in 50 years time, when the tree charter people say, whatever happened to those trees that we gave you, half a century ago, you can say, well, we can track every one of those that's still alive and show them. And we've got a picture for, for you for every month or every year, whatever it was that, that we've kept them. And the principle here is that you would do this for every asset in your council. So if you're responsible for typically park benches and someone sues you and says, look, grandma fell off a rotten park bench and she broke her hip, you can go back and say, look, we have a record of that park bench. We have a photograph of it taken every six months. And we have the state of it before inspection, after inspection, before maintenance and after maintenance. And basically, we can refute your claim because we can demonstrate that we have indeed been doing a thorough job. So photography worth a thousand words, reports worth a thousand words. You can put them all into the record associated with that specific item. Very handy way of filing things, I think. Okay, so we're now gonna get on with uh, putting in some layers ourselves. And I'm just gonna give you the basics of, of how we're doing it so you know what we're talking about. So the only place that it's possible for you to add layers is to the parish layers here, because that's what you own. Everybody else owns the other layers. And of course, you can't go messing around with their data. There's a slightly special case for allotments and cemeteries. 
uh, but we'll deal with that later on. And there's a really special case with the asset register, which comes to you ready built as infrastructure. All the layers are in place. You can't touch those. But the data that you put in, you can muck around with your heart's content. So that's a that's a one off. There's, there's nowhere else where you can do that. But parish layers are what we're going to be dealing with from now on for the rest of the session. <clears throat> so when you click on your parish layers in your copy of Parish Online, and I hope that we're about to get there, you want to say, uh, what is this new layer that I'm going to create going to store in the way of information? And therefore, how do I build it so that I can store that data? So um, if you are happy <laughs> with your, uh, using your PCs, and certainly I know you're all right, Phil, um, you don't need to pay much attention to this screen. It just says um, you're going to be moving between your Parish Online picture. And Stephen, are you prepared to use Parish Online this afternoon? Um, I don't have current access, so you don't have, I'll okay. have to watch. Well, you just watch. Then uh, you watch my screen and Phil may well be playing with his, uh, but we know that he's able to go from one to the other. So these, this particular slide we finished with. What we're going to do this afternoon is say, we want to store these bits of information. Um, yes, we'll use the title. Yes, we'll call it your name, Phil, followed by the word test, so you can track it down and delete it later if you want to. Okay. Uh, we're gonna use three, there are three types of geometry. We can use anyone you like, but I'm gonna use Polygon myself. Uh, yeah. We'll go into the description. You can make your own decisions about that. And we're gonna create three columns of data, although you must have at least one, and the three we're going to create will be called name, date, and status. Uh, mm. One of those will be a I'm name just, field. Sorry, I'm, a I've just lost my um, parish online. I just need to bring that back. Okay. Uh, well, give us Did a shout carry on. Ready. Carry on. I'm I'll, I'll chatter away, and, and you let yes. me know when you're ready. All right. So uh, we'll be creating three columns of data. One will be a text field called name, one will be a date field called date. And just to show you that I have no um, limits to my imagination, the status column will have some allowed values in it, and there will be three of them. The allowed values will be not yet started, under construction and finish. And by the word allowed values, we mean that when people go into this field, it has pop-ups and they pop up with, why don't you select one of these? Uh, there is room to add more, if they don't like the selection, you give them. But the beauty of pop-ups is, of course, you get data integrity, that you get, you get answers that are all the same, as opposed to one says not yet started and the other says not yet begun. It's nice that they all say not yet started databases like that. So moving on, um, we really need to know if you're ready, Phil. Are you back with us? Um I'm I'm with you, but I've not yet. <laughs> you haven't got Parish Online back yet. Um, nope, but I'm working on it. Okay, well let, let me let me chat to Phil. Uh, sorry, to to Stephen then. So Stephen, along the top of Parish Online, uh, on your main screen, is a list of menus, and that's these items uh, along the top up here. Mm -hmm. And the menu we're going to choose this afternoon is Create. Now, um, depending on what sort of account you've been given, it's it's possible that that create menu won't even exist uh, because you haven't been given enough rights to work in the system. So uh, you need to make sure that when they create your account, you're going to be of at least an editor status and preferably data manager. And I'll go into that later as to so which is which. Um, <clears throat> but what we're going to do today is create a new layer, which is basically the infrastructure on which we're going to hang um, some information shortly. So uh, we, we can come back to you, Phil, if you're... Um, yeah, I, well, I've got it up, but I've lost you now, so... <laughs> well, you don't need to see me. You need to go okay. into your parish online. Um, yeah. And you're going to go to the Create menu on the top line, and yeah. from the two drop-downs, select New Layer. New Layer. Success? Yes. Okay, then you've got a little pop-up window that says Create a New Layer, Enter the Layer Title. And yes. This is where you're going to put Phil's test, and I would put the word polygon in there as well. If you're going to choose a polygon, uh, because 
this will distinguish it from the other tests you're creating um, yes. on the next course. Then you're just happy, click on the next button. Yes. And it comes up and says, what geometry type do you want? That's a drop down list. Please select polygon. Yes. Then there's the layers <laughs> description. And here's a little bit of advice about this. All right. When you give this thing a title, the title is what will appear in that left hand column of layers. Okay. So it's not going to be very long and it may not be fully explanatory. So you fully explain here in this description why on earth you've created this layer and what it's supposed to do so that when you come back to it in six months time, um, you, you, you think, oh, yes, I remember that. Or uh, in two years time, when you're handing over to your successor, then again, they're not going to be puzzled by the thing you've called wobbly wop. Um, it actually has a meaning to it. So you don't have to put anything in here, but it's nice to put in a little description to help you when your memory fails next time you're back. Yes. When you're done, click on next. Okay. So then you've got create a new layer pops up. And yes. this is where we're creating the three columns of uh, data types that we want. So the first one, if you click on the plus sign in the top right, it will pop up and, with a line that says name, text, and add plus. Yes, we perfect. that's right. That, as it happens, the first field we wanted was called name and it was going to be a text field. So we're quite happy with that. Now we click on the plus sign again at the top right to add the second line. And it adds another line called name, text and add plus. And it gives you a red note that says you cannot have that because each yeah. field, each column must have a unique name. So you're now going to put your mouse over that second line that says name and just uh, scrub out the name and put in date instead. And then when you move along to the middle uh, column, change yeah. the, the text to date. Yes. And then you're ready for the last line. Uh, so you click on your plus sign one more time. Uh, do the same again. Change the name to read status. You leave the middle type as text. But this time, you're going to click on the add plus on that third row, please, Phil. Yes. OK, so in the add plus, it says, what do you want to add as the way of values? Your first one is going to be not yet started. So just type in not yet started in the middle. And when you've got that, click on the add word to the top right. Yes. And the second one, which is under construction. And then when you've done that, do a third add, and the answer is finished. <clears throat> and then you can confirm. And you should have three allowed values, not yet started, yeah. under construction, finished, you confirm, and we move on to, we're done. Yeah. So you, you now click on the green finish button. Um, I've got name, date, and status, text, date, and text. Yep. And then on the third one, I've got three items. Perfect. Those are the three you've just put in. They okay. started on the construction and finished. Okay. So you're all okay. set. Click on the green finish button. Yep. Okay. So you should have taken you back to your map and you wouldn't think anything has changed. Uh, so now is the time to click on your parish layers, Phil, which is the first of the beige layers. And um, if, right. Yes. So yes. yes. And down the bottom, if there are any layers there already, you'll find that Parish Online always adds the newest line to the bottom. So you'll yeah. find Phil's test at the bottom. Polygon, yes. You got it? Good? Yeah. <laughs> now that we've proven it's there, you're not going to do anything with it just yet. Okay. I want to, I want to make a suggestion. Um, you can't come back to my screen because you're having issues with that, but I'll just do this for um, Stephen's benefit. Uh, of those three columns, the name, the, the date, and the status, mm -hmm. um, it helps to have one of them required, which means that when someone creates a new record in your system, they have to fill in one of those forms because it's all too frequently for people to put a new dot on the map and they forget to put in any data at all in the left-hand column. And yes. you, can never, you can never find it again. How do you look for a dot? So, which has got no name. So we're going to make one of your columns required so that when people are adding new features to your column, you'll find that they, they must put something in there. 
So we're going to make a change to your columns and they're going to ask you, Phil, to go up to the top right hand corner where there's a cogwheel. Yeah. Click, click on the cogwheel and you get something called administration. Click yes. on that. Um, so it should pop up with a new screen where the middle column is empty, but it's going to fill in a second as soon as you've downloaded it from the cloud. And what it gives you is a list of all your layers. Yes, including Phil's test polygon. Perfect. At the bottom. So click on that one once just to highlight it. And then move up to the top of the right hand column. Yes. Which has got a, a layer details. Mm -hmm. And the right hand one of the two tabs underneath is a general and the columns. If you click on the columns one, you'll yes. see you'll see your three columns and the two first columns of search and query have all been filled in for you. Yeah. Now, we're going to say we want the name column to be a required column. So you click in that empty box beneath the required word on the third on the first name. Yes. Thing. Just click once on that. Yes. It's and, yep. Good. And then you'll find that above it on the right hand side, there is a nice bright yellow um, disc looking yeah. icon that is the save icon. So if you click on that, it'll save yeah. it. Yep. I've saved it. Good. And then it comes back and says, well, are you sure you wanted to save? And you got yeah. that. And then it did. And then I'm just doing this for Stephen, uh, Phil, whilst uh, he's watching my screen. So, Stephen, there's a little green pop-up uh, label that mm -hmm. pops up here. It's only there for about five seconds, but it just says I've saved it. However, once in a while, it may be red saying it hasn't saved it. And the usual reason for that is there's just been a momentary blip in your connectivity. So BT has done it to you yet again, um, and that stopped you from saving it. So you just click on the save button again, and it, it usually saves. I've never heard of it not saving it, but uh, it just just to let you know that if you uh, suddenly get that red thing, it's nothing serious. It just means that there was a connectivity break somewhere between you and the cloud. So, so question on this, I, I can imagine some uh, councils will want to make all of these fields absolutely required, because that's how some people are, uh, <laughs> yes. and like to have everything mandatory, um, whereas others will have the slightly more laissez-faire approach that you've suggested here of just having a single requirement. Where, where do you think the balance lies across the users? Um, I think you have a much better answer to that as soon as we start putting in data, because you'll see for yourself what the effect is of this required field. Um, mm, my, my solution would be, you must have one. I doubt that you need more than a couple. Right. Um, so to go back to the maps, Phil, you need to click on the little global icon in the middle of okay, the top can I, right. Can I just say that I realized I've got a, a spelling mistake in Phil's test polygon. So I've clicked edit, I've made the correction. How do I save that correction on the edit uh, layer? Is it the bottom right? You've got a save button? No, there or, isn't one. Okay, how about the icon on the top right? Big bright yellow icon? Uh, there isn't one up there either. Okay, let me um, unshare my screen. We'll go and have a look at yours. and You can show me where you've got to. So let me just give you the ability to share a screen. Okay. I look like the mad snowman, don't I? Okay. <laughs> Bill, um, you're in a position to share the screen with us? I can't uh, come up with that button for share. I so if you move your button. if you move your mouse to the bottom of your screen, it usually brings up a whole bunch of zoom icons. No, it hasn't. I think it's behind this edit screen. Right. Uh, what happens if you alt tab and pick the icon that's got a blue and white camera on it? Alt tab. So you press the Alt key and then just press the Tab yeah. key once. Nothing. Nothing, nothing at all? No. Uh, well, it hasn't changed the screen. Interesting. OK. And you're in Windows? Oh, you're oh, using... Hang on. Alt, Tab. Uh, just language. English United Kingdom, English United States. OK. That's on your keyboard. Um, not to worry. Uh, I think you'll find that if, if you did save it correctly, we'll see that. And if you didn't, all we've lost is that we've still got your... Um, okay, so I'll, I'll switch this layer off then if I can. Okay. So the edit layer, but I haven't got any... Okay, well, why don't you, um, in that case, let me share my screen back and we'll move on. Yeah. Um, and we'll go from there. 
So let me just move to the correct place. So we're going to go back to the on my screen is a summary of what we've done so far. So we've created yeah. a new parish layer, which you've called field test polygon. Yeah. We put the necessary columns in there, which are the three uh, name, status, and date. We configured status to have the three allowed values. We yeah. made name a required uh, column so that people will be forced to put you know, something in there. And then we saved it and we came back on the global icon to come back to maps. So hopefully you're back on the main uh, map screen now, Phil, in your parish online. No, I can't get rid of this layer, uh, this edit. Um, right, let me, let me just see if I can reproduce where you are so I can say what to do. Bear with me a second. Well, I'll just no, stop no. showing so I can pop into parish online. No, it's not. No, don't worry, I'm, I'm getting there. So you were in administration and you had your layer up and then you said, I need to make a change. So you clicked on the pencil, right? On the edit, yes. And this box has come up as edit layer. No, bear with me, I'm just getting there. Okay, so I'll go into my polygon and I'll say, I'll make a change and I'll edit it. And I made the change. And when you made the change on the... Hello? Uh, yes, are you still with me? Yeah. So when you made the change, I need to find a different one to do this. Let me go there. I've now got a fourth one. So when you make the change, where were where did you make the change actually in the layers or in the, in the title in the title. So test polygon right so you should be on a window which has a big bright um couple of buttons on the bottom right hand corner one says save and one says cancel you don't see any of them covered by that. something else okay if, if it, i tell you what's uh, Phil, we'll just save time and, and be drastic uh, and just say, we can go to the top left corner of your screen yeah. and click on the recycle, the refresh screen, refresh button, the, the circular arrows. I've done that. Here okay, you so your um, parish online will restart and you will, you will go from there. Okay. So let me go back into sharing a screen so that you've got, someone's got something to see. And, yes. and I'm going to go back to the polygon. Let's move that from there. Let's go back to the main thing. And I should be in the presentation, right? Yeah. So you should be back on the main screen now, Phil, and you have your parish layers there. And if you open up your, your test layers at the bottom, Yes, I've got that. I've clicked on it. So right click on it. Right. Yeah. Bring up a little mini menu, one word of which, or well, the second item of which is add feature. Yes. Okay. Click on that. It's done it. <laughs> okay. And now, again, this is for Stephen's benefit as much as anything else. So he's seeing my screen. The field that we made a required field name is now surrounded in red. Yes. And it says it is required. So the first thing for you to do is to put something in there. And <clears throat> if you're following my example, then we're going to create a pavilion or something. So you might call it test pavilion or Phil's pavilion or something like that. Anything you like. Yes, test pavilion. Right. You can select today's date just so you see how to select a date. Yeah. And you can click on status, the little down arrow, and select one of the status fields. Um, not yet started might be a good one. Or, yeah. under, or under construction. Fair enough. Yeah. What you find is that the gray save button down the bottom is still grayed out. It doesn't let you save. No, it doesn't. Because you haven't actually put anything on the map yet. Okay. So where are you going to put this test pavilion? You can either just plonk it on the screen in front of you, or you can move your screen to a point where you may wish to put a pavilion. It's entirely up to you. This yeah. is only for play purposes. Uh, but when you're ready, let me know, and we'll talk okay. about the next I'll step. Put it on. 
Okay, so as you um, move... No, I haven't. I've got a cross <laughs> no, and you a haven't. blue spot, but it looks as if I'm got, I've got a line. Whenever I move yeah. that cross, up, the line okay. comes with right. it. Right, so hang on with me. This is, again, I'm talking for um, Stephen's purposes. Yeah. All right. When you move the mouse, Stephen, over the map itself, it changes from a normal arrow cursor to a crosshairs. Yes. And the crosshairs, you can say, I'm going to mark, let's say, the top left corner of my new pavilion. And you just left click once. And then as you move the mouse, a nice blue line follows where you move the mouse. Yes. And when you get to the first corner of the pavilion, you can left click again and change direction. So you might go through a right angle, for instance, and you start doing the next wall. And then when you've got that complete you click once again change direction and last time and when you've got all four walls of the pavilion listed you then do a double click to show that you finished yep let's so, work all right so i'm just uh, doing this on for uh, steven's benefit now uh phil bear with me a second so i'm just phil we're gonna we've got a crosshairs we're gonna put in the top left corner uh, we went around and created this very fancy shape here by mm -hmm. clicking once every time I wanted to change direction. You'll mm -hmm. note I beautifully maintained that this is A, not a proper right angle, and B, we're not properly aligned with the boundary because that will be something we do later um, yeah. to show how to fix that. So now, uh, Phil, you should be fine that you can click on the save button because it's now yeah. fully blacked. So do that, please. Done it and it's saved successfully. Good. And, and then the you should find that your red. pavilion has shown up in red. Yes. OK. The left hand column is a blank record in the feature editor because the system says if you've added one feature, you probably need to add several. So I'm going to give you a new blank record to do that. But in this case, oh. for today's exercise, we're only going to add one item. So we finished. So you can click on the X by the word feature editor. OK. Cl close the, name the, box. the name box is still in red. Yeah, 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 because it's a brand new blank record. Okay. Just in case you want to put something else on. Yeah? Exactly. So okay. if you say we're done, click on the X and it'll disappear. That's it. All right. Now then, same principle as before. If you want to find out more about your new pavilion, you click on it. So click so anywhere you like in your red square. Yes. Okay. And then your button comes up on the left. Your column comes up with the data record for the pavilion, right? Yeah, it's just got one line. It's parish fills test polygon. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes, but there should be details underneath. You put the date in, didn't you? Um, yes. And it shows that? No. <laughs> okay, so where are we looking at that shows fills test polygon? It's on the left-hand side of the screen. It's got select layer with a cross by it, and then it's got parish, and under that is fills test polygon. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so click on that. Click on the fills test polygon. And it'll bring you up the data. Right. right. Name is right. Test Pavilion Date. Yep. Yeah, it's perfect. It's not yet started. So you've, got, you've now got the same on your screen as uh, Stephen is seeing on mine. Yeah. So a few differences that to notice. First of all, um, the red box has now been surrounded by a blue line. Yes. To show you that that's the item that you've selected. So you can imagine that if you've got uh, half a dozen new pavilions that you're building, you need to know which one you've selected. It yes. nicely outlines it in blue for you. Second item is that uh, you have the ability to add an attachment to this record now. Yep. All right. You cannot do that when you're first creating a record. There's no attachment line shows up. But as soon yeah. as you go back into it, then you have the ability to add attachments. Okay. And thirdly, across the top of your feature um, column, now you have the little pencil mark to show you want to make changes. Yes. You have a, a dustbin to show you want to delete it. Yes. And you have a filter funnel, which we will ignore for the moment, and the three dots, which we'll ignore for the moment. Okay. Yes. So coming down to uh, let's make some changes just so that you can get the hang of how we do this. And I'm going to say, uh, Phil, I want to change the shape of your pavilion, right? No matter how beautifully yeah. you've, uh, you've drawn it, it's it's the wrong shape. You've probably drawn it square. I want it triangular. OK. Yeah. So to do that, you first of all need to click on the pencil at the top left to show you're going to make changes. 
Yeah. And by the way, if you had made a, a a typing error or you didn't want to call it Fields Pavilion, you want to call it Fred's Pavilion, this is how you can do it. You can now change those those records in the left hand yeah. side. Okay. Okay. But what we're going to do is to make changes to the pavilion itself. And I suggest just for argument's sake, zoom in a bit. So click on the plus sign or move your mouse wheel. Yep. So we move in a bit. Uh, and then move your cursor over any part of the blue lines around your pavilion. So I'll put it uh, on the blue line. Yes. Yep. And a little blue ball will appear. Yes. And now you can pull it into shape. So say put it on one of the corners and pull the corner out into a triangle. Just, just something that makes you change the shape. Okay. okay. And then for the purposes of uh, Steve, what I've done is zoomed in a bit so that it's, you can now see it's much easier to line up the edge of my pavilion with the boundary line of the field, which I didn't do when I first do it. And you can also see that these corners here are far from rectangular. So if I wanted to, this would be the chance when I would make changes. I would click on the blue line um, and this little blue dot that you see down here in the bottom left corner yeah. is, and you can move that around, pull it to any shape you like, and you can see that I've now moved the boundary line so that it's, it's lined up with the edge of the building or the other way around, yeah. I've lined up the edge of the building with the boundary line. Um, and you can get any shape you like, you know, sort, of sort things out. And then when you're happy, just click on save. If you're happy, Phil, click on save. Um, save, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Question for you on that, Graham. Yeah, um, we've got the scale in the bottom left hand corner, which I, I can see on this yeah. slide. Um, if I wanted my pavilion to be 30 meters long along the roadside, how do I ensure that I've I've got it, you know, the right distance from the corner of the field and it's 30 meters long? Um, I, I, it, the, the answer to that is it's simple. Um, Good. But I, I would need to show it to you on my screen. It's not built into this presentation. So okay. let's come. I'll come back to that into the Q and A session and just show you because it is a piece yeah. of cake. It's a very simple, very sensible question. Right. So, Phil, for your exercise now, we just want to add an attachment to this record so you can see how it's done. Yeah. Um, and on your left hand column, you've got a button that says Add Attachment. Uh, a plus, I've got attachment zero yep. and a plus with it. Right, so click on the plus. Yeah. And then it says add attachment. Yes. Right, do that and then select any file you like from your computer. It can be a photograph, it can be a spreadsheet, it can be a picture of your dog standing on its head. I don't mind what it is. Yep. We're just doing the yep. exercise. So, and the purpose of this is when you add it, it takes a few seconds because you're taking your document and you're adding it to the cloud so it takes a few seconds depending on how big a document you've selected yeah. or photograph but it is working and then once it's done it'll show up as the attachment uh much the same way as it i showed with, it, with a green cloud and an arrow and a perfect. perfect so you're all done so all that was i've now shown you how to add an attachment um any, any <clears> limit on the size of attachments there, no none or? whatsoever no no there's no limit. It's so limit. if I click add attachment again, it will want me to put another one on. It will, yes. Yeah. But How do I save people, what I've put on? Uh, it's already saved for you. It's up in the cloud safely. Okay. You don't need yeah. to do any more. So uh, on my screen, Phil, which you're not looking at at the moment, it just uh, highlights that if you wanted to get rid of all this, and for the sake of you, if you're going to be doing other courses, you may want to leave it where it is but yeah. you can just, just delete it. This is the point where you can delete. Yeah. Bear in mind, what you're deleting is a single feature from the layer. Yes. Uh, we can indeed delete the layer itself, should you need to. And this is where I would explain to both of you that Parish Online is a really, really forgiving system. When you're designing a new layer, you don't have to get it perfect first time. If you suddenly decide after a couple of, of days of playing around with it, that actually not only do you need a status and a name and a date, but you also need to know the name of the person who designed it, uh, you can yeah. go back and add that. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can make changes all the way through in Parish Online without any problem whatsoever. It's a piece of cake. It's a very forgiving system. So don't worry about 
uh, having to get every single detail perfect first time round, you don't need to. The second point is that uh, often quite a lot of work in parish online means following an existing boundary. You know, you're going to put uh, uh, a new, uh, I don't know, maybe the parish has taken over a piece. Of, oh, I guess the opposite, obvious one is if you're going to send out a mowing contract to people yeah. and you want to highlight the areas that they're going to mow and they won't have perfect edges, they'll be um, rounded and bumped and squared and all sorts of things. When you're adding that area to your map, do it in what I would call a quick and dirty style, okay? If it's a, a square, but it's not a perfect square, just draw a square and then go in and change it once it's been saved once, because it is far, far easier to do um, edits to corners and alignments and all sorts of little things uh, when you zoom in and get that part of the screen quite large, it then becomes blindingly obvious what changes you need to make. It's very much difficult to get it right the first time if you're trying to do it the first time. So quick and dirty to start off and yeah. then edit it later. I can't tell you the pain I caused myself by thinking I must get this right first time and you get three quarters of the way down and then you make an error and the whole lot disappears. It's really, really irritating. So do the quick outline first and then just tie it up later. It's a piece of cake. Uh, what else have we got? All right. I then promise to tell you a little bit about the asset register. Um, <clears throat> the asset register is built into Parish Online as the second of the beige layers uh, and it's already got an infrastructure and it's the same infrastructure that councils all the way across the country are using and so you cannot make changes just to suit your own needs to it in fact you can't make any changes to it because we're trying to keep it the same for everybody however it does already contain nearly every piece of information that you will want to store in terms of an asset and uh, a recording it and b making sure you've got the correct values and so forth in place for insurances so yeah. one of the biggest purposes of the asset register is to help you with insurance uh, yeah. it has all sorts of fields that will help you there like when did you buy it when did you last value it how much did you value it for that sort of thing you can add as many records for as many assets as you wish and you can change every one of them but you cannot change the structure yeah, it's your data. So um, anything that you put in there is only visible to someone who logs into uh, your parish account. So nobody and I can't see anything that you're doing and you don't see anything that I'm doing at the parish level. OK, OK, so, my my login details begin admin at. Yes, so I've got ad administrative rights. Yes, you do. If I wanted somebody else in the parish to be able to access it, what do I do? Uh, if you go to, and this, we're almost into the Q&A session, so I think we'll just yeah. go ahead with this. If you go, you're still in your parish online? Um, I am. I've, I've now brought uh, you back, but I can always go back to parish online. Well, if you go to the top, let me see. Um, I can do this for so that Stephen can benefit from this as well. Let's just go to here. And we go to Parish Online. So, Stephen, you're now seeing my screen? I am, yep. Okay, so if you want to add a new user, that's an administrative action. So top right corner for services, click on administration. Yeah. And what you're going to be dealing with is users. So click on users up here. And you'll see right. it pops up with the various users I've got. Yeah. And as soon as you highlight any one of them, you can now, their details pops up in the right-hand side. You can okay. click on the little, the little pencil to edit it. Yeah. Or if you want to add somebody, you just click on a plus sign. Yeah. All right. You notice how all of these fields are required. They don't mess around with users, right? They want all sorts of details. Yeah. What's of really interest to you is this type button. All right. There are four types. Reader is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, uh, you can't change anything, but you can see everything. Yeah. Editor is you're able to change something that's already there, but you can't create anything new. Right. Data, data manager is the next step up. You can create new layers, 
and you can add new features. And data managers can do everything uh, that an admin can do except look at the billing information. So if you look over my top left here, I've got a chart called or a line a yep. chart called billing. The data managers cannot see that. It's not very important. I don't know why it's a fuss, but it is. So, uh, but that's the only difference between a data manager and admin. If you're going to be creating anybody who's going to be um, to the system, they need to be at least an editor. Yes. Um, and unless you're really worried about them messing up the system, I'd be inclined to make them a data manager. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not that, that crucial, but if you want them to add new layers, and I think most people do want to be able to add new layers. They need to be data managers. Okay. Okay. Now, what was that one that I promised I'd come back to you for, Stephen? How do you draw to scale? How do you draw to scale? That's a yeah. great question. All right. So let's go back to the main map. And we go about this a little bit back backwards, if that's a good praise. Mm -hmm. um, there is a wonderful feature up here called Tools and measure, all right? So you can go and say, I'm interested in measuring a length. What lengths do you want to see? It'll be from there to there. And then it'll tell you, well, if I double click, it tells you how long that is. All right, now you can change the scale and say, I don't, sorry, that one, I don't want it to be in, I want it to be in meters. All right, so that, that line on this scale represents 500 meters. So that will happen on any uh, level that you're working on. So if it's crucial to you that your um, line is of the correct scale, the simplest way to do it, uh, I, mean, I can finish with this now, let's just dump it. Yeah. <clears throat> is, is, is to adjust the scale so that you've got this in an indicator here. You suggested 30 meters, I think didn't you, that you wanted to draw a pavilion that was 30 meters mm -hmm. long or something. So I, let me come into my recreation ground. I'm gonna turn off this, but I'm gonna change the scale and say, I'm gonna add in my test layer, I'm gonna add a line that is 30 meters long. All right, so I'm gonna add a new feature. And here I can see that at this scale, that distance is 200 meters. So let's say if I want 30, it's going to be somewhere along mine, which is, you know, about two centimeters long. So that if I do a line there uh, and there, that's probably a little bit more than 30 meters. But we can now say, so do a tools. <coughs> Sorry, they want, me to, uh, they want me to save it. Yeah, that's line. Save it. And now we've got it here. We're going to go into our tools and we're going to that's right, get rid of that. Tools, measure. What do you want to measure? I want to measure my line. So there to there. And you can see I've got six meters. Now you wanted, uh, sorry, I've got rods there. Let's come out, let's just double click. So I finished. Let's change that to meters. And my measure, woo, I did 34, wow. Uh, <laughs> and you wanted, you wanted 30, it wasn't a bad guess. Sorry, yeah. so you're under the 30 meter line, but you're, you've got a, a broad indication here. For, uh, can you see this on my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so down the bottom, there is the, that line is 200 meters long. So if you want to draw on as 30, you just estimate it and put it in, and then you can tidy it up to exact measurements by being able to measure it. Um, so, so if the if other we, way, sorry, go so ahead. You've taken some pains to construct the pavilion and it's 30 meters by 20. It's the right shape. All the corners are nice and square. And then through discussion, you decide, well, we're not going to have it onto the road that is running north south. We're going to have it backing onto the road that's running east. -west. <laughs> you pick the whole thing up and turn it round. <coughs> you have to start all over. Um, two answers to that question. Um, and this is a bit like Windows, really, Stephen. You know, there are 15 ways of doing anything in Windows, and there are three sure. ways of doing anything in, in Parish Online. So to answer your question one way, if it's just a matter of like you've drawn it here, yep. in your 20 by 30, and then suddenly you want it up here, you can just pick up each point on this, uh, your diagram here, and move it. 
and you'll end up with your square being moved from here to here. Mm -hmm. You're probably faster to scrap it and start again, but mm -hmm. there is a better solution. All right, when you're adding, let me just think about where we do this now, in a polygon, I think. So let me add a new polygon. Yeah. You can say up here is a nice little diagram that says, what do you want in the way of a rectangle? And you can do a preset. And you can yeah. say, I want it 30 meters long. Yeah. And I want it 10 meters high. Yeah. All right. And it says, OK, where do you want it? Click on the map. And there is your box. It's 10 by 20 or 30. So you can right. preset as soon as you're doing a polygon. If you do a preset uh, in a line, you'll get a length. But, you know, if you're going to build a building, it's going to be multilateral and therefore it'll be a polygon and you get the chance to determine the length of the sides. OK. Very handy that somebody did think about that. <laughs> I just ask a quick one uh, then. Okay. If I'm going to plot all our trees in the parish and their state and which are most urgent need of um, attention. Yeah. Can I create separate layers for each variety of tree? You can, but there are better ways. Of, there are better ways of doing it. Yeah. All right. So first of all, are the trees already in the system? Uh, no. Okay. So, so the first thing I would say to you is um, turn on your photography. All right, because the yeah. beauty of the photography is, and we have to wait because this is a lot of data that's pouring down from the internet. So bear with me whilst I chat. Okay, it's arrived. Let me turn off the, uh, the the map so we just get the photograph. You see, you've now got all the trees. So yes. if you zoom in, it's a piece of cake once you've got your layer set up to say, I'm going to add a new feature, and you just circle each tree. And you've got one tree, you've got a dozen trees here, whatever. But you've already got them. And this is a wonderful example around the tennis court. All right. Each individual tree is very visible. Yeah. So you can put them in quite quickly just by going around the photograph. Can I just put a spot value on them? The uh, yeah, it's a point value, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, it depends if, you, yes, just, just do a point for trees. Second thing is there's a thing called style, which lets you distinguish one tree from another. Okay. So, if you, and again, I'm just going to use my screen for an example. If I, let me go and have a look at something we've got style on. Uh, planning applications are a classic example. So if I go into here and say, I want to change the style. Yeah. All right. Up will come a screen and it says, here I've got the, the different decisions. You have a color green for approved, purple for waiting. Yeah, uh, an application withdrawn, and of course a red would be refused. But you could yeah. say oak trees one color, ash trees another, yeah. uh, elders a third, and beech a fourth, and you can have yeah. any number of colors. So each of your trees is represented by a different color. You don't need to have a different layer for each type. Okay. And then when you want, you can filter them out. So if you have a whole bunch of trees and you say I just want to see the ashes, um. Yeah. You can uh, you can just push a button and all everything else except ash disappears. Okay, it's really handy. So I would say keep them all on the same layer. Just give them a different color for each type. Okay. And if you and, attend any more of my training sessions, you'll know how to do it. I'm coming to the styling one as well. <laughs> okay, good. For you. I've got one every day of the week this week. I know. I know. It's it's, it's entertainment itself. It uh, is actually. It's fascinating. Yeah, good. <laughs> right. Um, let me just go back to the presentation and make sure I've actually finished telling you what I promised to tell you. So as we certainly discussed that. Uh, oh, yeah, menu headings. All right. So let me just show you those. Uh, well, in actual fact, you've seen for yourself, haven't you? But um, menu, menu, menu. Uh, sorry. Here we go. So if we come out of here. And we just roll along the top, all the way along the top of Parish Online are various menu headings. Each one of these is a drop down list. You've got many more drop downs than others. The way to find out what each of these does is to go into the knowledge base, which is through your cogwheel up here and the help and support column. 
Yeah. Right. So if you if you've forgotten what I told you today and you want to create a new layer, all right, ask how I do it. Create a layer. All right. And it comes up and says create map layers. It gives you on in almost every case, you get a video that tells you how to do it. In this case, you get two videos. And further down, you get a list of step by steps if you're the sort of person that learns better from step by steps. OK. Yeah. So the way to find out what any map menu means is to go into the uh, the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So going back to here, there are also menus uh, along here, and there are menus all the way along the bottom, or items all the way along the bottom, and there are many menus you get from Dick Downer. You're doing the both both menu courses, 102 and 103. So you'll be an expert at the end of this. And Stephen has disappeared. So I hope he's in hearing range and he can hear us. Uh, I think that is the last slide, but let's just go and make sure. Yes. Okay. So then the question comes, Stephen, uh, Phil, sorry. Is there anything else that we can answer for you today? No, I've got, uh, I'm well equipped now to have another play for an hour or so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, um, one, one quick question. If I identify a playing field as parish council property, yes, I put the pavilion in the middle of it, yes, um, and I want to get rid of the playing field but leave the pavilion, Will they both be on the same layer? Because one will be a polygon and one will be a line, won't it? Correct. And no, they're not on the same layer. And that's the beauty of it. You can turn one layer off and still see okay. the pavilion, but no boundary. And you can do it the other way around. So you can see the boundary, but not the pavilion. Or you can show them both at once and you get both. Yeah, that, fine. That, that's as I thought, but uh, thanks In for fact, that. That's exactly what we will be doing on your next course. Okay. So, Stephen... Um, your your share of questions and answers now is there anything that you need to keep or anything that you haven't had answered you'd like answered no no that's all been very good thank you that's um open the whole thing up and uh, give me a good understanding of how to get going on it um good. i i will probably be um i'm thinking about where i'd want to sit on this data manager is probably going to be the, the the level to be at i think for the kind mm. of work that i want to be doing um, we're going to be looking at hedges, we're going to be looking at ditches, I can see that's a mixture of lines and polygons. Um, the styling thing, really useful, um, and I can see how we could use that. Um, within that, you, you were talking about using colour for species, but presumably within the table that you've got associated with that, you could also put things like age, general condition, whether it's got ivy growing through it and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Absolutely, yes. Um, and yeah. you'd fill in those layers. There is, I think, in the asset register, an entry for trees. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I should have mentioned this in the asset register. Um, if you want to store information that they don't give you the chance to store, you just create your own new layer in parish layer. And then when you're showing the asset register item, you show your parish layer at the same time and they both show up in the same place. So you play with that opacity tool to- um, abso Absolutely. Now I was gonna show you, what was I gonna show you? I'm gonna show you, oh, we aren't even on shared screens yet. Sorry, let me just share my screen again. So let's come back to here. And you were asking about hedges and things uh, and i wanted to show you um first of all make sure uh, in the asset register i think there are trees yes so the sorts yeah. of questions that they ask you in trees are nothing to do with the tree itself i mean yes there's a species there's a height yeah um, there's a canopy spread there's a planted date there's an age but if you wanted to say it's infected with ivy or covered with beetles or, or mm -hmm. whatever Mm -hmm. You would need to put those in a separate layer, but you can tie it in with this one so that when you're showing a specific tree in this uh, field, it'll also show up in the in your own layer. I should yeah. have mentioned that at some point that Parish Online is clever enough to tie together all the layers so that they show the same part of the information. So mm -hmm. if you've got a layer with 400 trees in it, and you've only got 30 trees in your asset register, when you're looking at any tree in the asset register and you turn on your layer, it'll show you the same tree, which is really clever. It's really nice. 
Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you was um, information from your local authorities. Okay. Yeah. Lots of county councils will have a lot of the information that you want already in their systems, but they may or may not have exported any of that data to Parish Online. It's a very much an individual county thing. And my experience in the past has been it's a matter of ignorance and education that if you can show them that A, the data that they have is extremely useful to you, and B, it's a piece of cake for them to get the information to you, then I find that they fall over themselves to be helpful. But last year, there was absolutely no information being exported by Somerset County Council at all. And then we started talking to them and they're now exporting 10 layers of data to us. And I mentioned this because you mentioned you were talking about gullies and hedgerows and things, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen. Well, our County Council has, uh, exported all the information they've got on gullies to us so we can see which gullies they know about and which ones they're fixing or um, they made deliberately or whatever and the same is true for these other things in so public rights of way or what you or i would call footpaths um, but that's a huge amount of data so to have them exporting to that to us saves a huge amount of work at the parish level because all those paths are already there and mm -hmm. is that the definitive map that they're exporting? Say again, sorry? Is that the definitive map? Each county council has a definitive ah. map of footpaths. <laughs> My experience is it's considerably, it's often considerably out of date. Mm. Right, so um, in Somerset, as an example, they've got maps at two levels of detail and they export the least level of detail to us but you have to go to a separate website to find the really detailed one. And I suspect mm. that it's really detailed because that's the one that they're keeping up to date. Okay. Uh, it's a mystery as to why they won't export that one to Parish Online for us. And we keep trying to get them to do it. But well, that's, well, that's, that's for your local county, county council. Now. now your local district council can also be persuaded to share all sorts of things with you which are really helpful. So the 106 agreements, your conservation areas, your tree preservation orders, and in particular planning applications, it's all massive time savers if they will export them to you. If you need help in getting them to do that, please do feel free to contact me and we'll work on it for you. Do you think we're going to be successful with South Kestman, Graham? Oh, uh, yes, I got the impression from talking to Thomas that he's done it in the past but it's just so out of date that it's all been forgotten and people have ignored it. Well, he so, did say I'm the only person who's ever asked a question about it. <laughs> the elected members don't know anything about it, despite no. the fact they're paying for it. Yeah, I, exactly. But, um, we'll, you, you know, it'll get there. As, as yes. Someone said it's a wonderful example, because last year we had nothing, now we've got 10 layers. I always throw the example to people about Baines. I mentioned Baines to you. Yeah. Uh, Phil, but for your information, uh, Stephen, Baines is a unitary in Somerset, Bath and North East Somerset is shortened to Baines. They have a GIS department like every other county council. Um, they made the decision over a decade ago, to about 12 years ago, that rather than have the parishes call them up and say, please, could we have a map showing the footpaths in our area? Please, could you change that footpath to this bit here? They said, to hell with this, you can all have a free copy of Parish Online on the condition you never call us again. <laughs> <laughs> Do it all yourself. And this, by buying a bulk copies of Parish Online, the discount was so tremendous that it would actually save them lots of money. And they've done that every year since. So for 12 years now, uh, Baines has been um, shrinking their GIS department because they don't have the phones ringing all the time with these idiotic questions from idiotic councils that can't work out for themselves. Yeah. But the beauty of it is, is that they, they export 400 layers of data constantly to those parishes. So when your parish says to your county council says, well, what sort of data do you want? And we'd say 400 layers, please. <laughs> and they will look at you in astonishment and say, look, 
the stuff that you've got that's really useful to us is footpaths, um, school catchment areas, gullies, highway uh, department, you know, which bits of highway do you maintain and which do we maintain? In particular, the, uh, the hedgerows and the pieces of grass at the edge of the road. Which ones do you mow and which ones has we got to mow? And yeah. they've all got that data, but they don't seem to realize that you actually need to know about it. Yeah. So there's endless streams of data that they can export. Exporting is a piece of cake because Geosphere does all the work for them at no charge. Yeah. Uh, so it's really just well worth pursuing with both your district and your county councils. Please, please, please export your data to Parish Online. And Parish Online does all the work for you. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Thanks very much, Graham. Thank you. You're very welcome. Look, glad to see you. See you next time. Okay. okay. Bye, Stephen. Thanks, bye -bye, very much. Thanks Graham. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Bye bye. Goodbye. That must be a way of saying goodbye. Oh, yeah. Stop showing my screen. There I go.